not here speaking on talking to the dead. She's going to tell us more about that. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, some title of my talk is Talking to the Dead, <coughs> Grief, Loss, and Acts of Courage. And I'm going to start with a poem by Stan Rice. Um, this collection is called Some Lamb. And uh, Stan and Ann had a daughter uh, who died of leukemia when she was six years old. And so this book uh, is a lot about that process of, of that loss. So I'm going to start with a poem from Stan called The Bones of Woe. Golden are the bones of woe. Their brilliance has no place to go. It plunges inward, spikes through snow. Of weeping fathers whom we drink and mother's milk, and final stink, we can dream but cannot think. Golden bones encrust the brink. Golden, silver, copper, silk. Woe is water shocked by milk. Heart attack, assassin, cancer. Who would think these bones such dancers? Golden are the bones of woe. Skeleton holds skeleton. Words of ghosts are not to know. Ignorance is what we learn. Um, so I'll pass this around if people want to look at it. And then I'm going to start my talk. So, um, which is the one I pushed? This one? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do is I wrote a visual poem, and I'm going to start with that. And, and then I'm going to talk about grief. And uh, I'm and the lost acts of courage and final poems. And I, I'm basically going to talk about my own process of grief that I've gone through, uh, losing my husband, and then uh, there's other things you can grieve as well. So grief doesn't just mean losing a person; it could mean losing uh, a breast or losing your home, or there's a lot of things you can end up in the throes of grief over. So it'll, it's for all of that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the, um, the visual poem, which I've never done a visual poem before. So each line has a, uh, a, an image. All of the images, um, other than the ones are, that I have created myself for this talk, all of these are from uh, Creative Commons Flickr, so they all have they're all, you know, I, I've given the attribution in the um, alt text field uh, for each each of these photos by people, and they're all um, they all have Creative Commons licenses, so they're fine to be used. So, do you talk to the dead? Do the dead talk to you? Do they drop in for visits? Do you see them in dreams? Do they randomly appear? Did you do a double take? Was that deja vu? Are they in the mirror? Or on a street? Or on a train? In the sunshine? Or in the rain? You might sense them anywhere. You might even hear them speak. Did someone call your name when you were alone? Did someone touch your shoulder in an empty room? Are the dead electrical, toying with your tech? Are the birds their messengers or butterflies or snakes? This poem of questions dances with the dead. It has no answers. 
It waits as the dead wait, share in the same space. Selah. So Selah is, uh, if you look it up, uh, there's there's discussion about what it really means, but it kind of I, I'm using it um, in the way that it's used in the Psalms, which is more like Amen or so be it. And so this this actually is a picture of um, the Silver Strand State Park Beach, which is uh, the first beach I went to when I was a very young child. So I'm, I am going to show pictures of the beaches I grew up going to throughout this presentation. So, um, no grief. <clears throat> grief is difficult. So, you may have heard already of the stages of grief. Um, they're typically listed in this way, denial and isolation, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Um, so there are other people who break it down into more fine, you know, more lists than this, but this was the original like five, kind of five item list. And I was really happy when I saw this mm -hmm. figure because when you see the stages of grief, you, you think, oh, it's this is how I'm going to first be this way, then it's going to be this way, then it's going to be the other way. But in reality, everything can happen at once and very chaotically. So grief is nonlinear. It doesn't happen in those neat five stages. And it's very overwhelming. confusing and for me it was sort of like a series of emotional tsunamis that I never knew when they were going to occur and I had this sense the whole time that my heart was mummified it was uh, really disconcerting because I didn't feel like I had a broken heart. I felt like it was like mummified. So anyway, Jonathan made me a mummified heart. It turned into a present. The yes. Presents, yeah. Yes. Oh. It's much nicer than my actual how my mummified heart felt. <laughs> <laughs> How did we get there? Anyway, so I couldn't find a picture of a mummified heart on the internet that was like um, something I could use that didn't have copyright protection because I was only looking in, you know, kind of in the Creative Commons pages. So I found this, what looks like an actual giant knitted anatomical heart to sort of use in, instead of a mummified heart. But I had, for me, I had this sense that like this mummification process happened in my heart. And also I had a very real flash of understanding. I remember when I was young and they would, you know, you hear the stories that when someone dies in India, the woman would just throw herself on her husband's funeral pyre. I get it completely now. I just somehow understand that, <laughs> however irrational it seems. So my year one observations, and this is Sonoma County uh, <coughs> Vineyards, and this time of year, this is what they look like, and it's really beautiful up there. Um, my year one observations, mainly I was fogged in, and I actually, in retrospect, um, feel that this uh, sense of being enveloped in a fog, like you're peeking out, uh, is a, um, a protective mechanism. It's a, it's a, 
a mechanism to protect you during the grief process. And I'll, I'll explain more why I think that further in. Um, so my first year also, the weird thing is, it was the year of losing umbrellas. I must have had, you know, six little folding umbrellas, and for some reason, I lost them all in that year. And I'm not a person that typically loses things, so I definitely knew that I wasn't functioning in my, in my normal way. And pretty much a year of hiding in my office at work, too. Because I never knew, you know, I'd be, one day I was at work, I'm sitting there, just, you know, some trigger happened, and I'm weeping. Knock at the door, I open the door, it's another manager, completely freaked him out because I was crying at work. And he's like, maybe you should go home. I'm like, no, no, in five minutes I'll be back to normal again. And I was like, oh, tsunami. And then, then you're left on the beach. So it was a year of hiding, definitely. And um, I also had to move because when I had to rent my house, so I had to move everything into the city, which was more chaotic and unsettled. Dealing with a lot of stuff in a really short period of time while being kind of out of it was difficult. Between meltdowns. I couldn't find a good picture of someone having a meltdown, but I thought this sad little Amazon box person <laughs> was good. <laughs> and I, just the constant sense of this shock that, like, you, you can't believe, did that really happen? Yes, it really happened. Your life changed in an instant. It was also, there were some unusual things that were good that happened. It was the year of that I never had to pay for coffee. I somehow, I don't know why, and I had bought three $60 Starbucks gift cards, but they were among his things. Or someone had given him some. And, um, and then somebody else, I guess, I don't know, somebody else gave me like three pounds of coffee. It was just like the whole year, I just had coffee. And the overwhelming kindness of my friends and family, which is one of the blessings. <coughs> year of Lunches with David Thompson, which I really looked forward to. That was good. And I lucked out having this grief counselor uh, named uh, Carol Schlesinger. And um, the first time I uh, saw her, she like hands me this piece of paper. And it was a one page sheet that listed all of the ways that grief will affect you. Physically, meant all the ways. And so it was great because right off the bat, I was told, here, if any of these things happen, they're normal. <laughs> that was a really good. So I was very lucky um, <coughs> to have such a good grief counselor. Um, she did work for hospice. That was the only kind of counseling she did. So, yeah, that was that was a, a real a real blessing. Pretty tree. <coughs> hmm? Beautiful tree. Yeah. So year two. That's where I call. That's when I feel like I began actually feeling more pain. And I do think it's because you have that protective mechanism of being in the fog during the first year. And it's like whiplash, because if you've ever had whiplash, what happens is, bonk, everything in the neck swells up to keep you from moving it. So it protects everything. And when that swelling goes down, that's when you start getting the nerve pain, and that's when the whip that's when you get the pain of the whiplash. After the swelling went down, 
So I felt like with my first year, I was in that fog. It's like a cocoon protecting me from some of the pain. That then comes the second year. So that was my experience anyway. Um, year three, year three, I felt like I was back somehow inside, able to contact who I was. And uh, that like inner, inner sunny part of me. But it took three years for that. And then I felt like it, by year four I was actually turning a corner and I was like more, more back to normal. Time is the healer. I didn't take this picture, but I have been there, and this is a really great astronomical clock in the old town of Prague. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. And all these things all move, and the people come out, and it's, it's a really neat sight. And um, I, I, I have pictures of it, but uh, I just took this one from Creative Commons. And time does heal grief. So the tsunamis begin lessening. It's the, the triggers, the things that like are gonna throw you into that like deep sadness. Say la. This is Coronado Beach at sunset. And Coronado was another beach I went to a lot growing up in San Diego. So now I'm gonna talk about the lost, what's lost, but what is found, because there were some really good things that came out of it. So you lost a friend, or you lost your house, or you're grieving. And when, when you're thrown into grief, you end up with, or I ended up with some weird interior landscapes. Um, and so I wanted to pick a few of them that sort of, um, you, your interior landscape changes because of the shock that you've had. So for me, it might be like a desert. I might have felt very alone and <coughs> barren. And I felt like I was in an abyss constantly, just overwhelmed pretty much. And it was kind of like white water and riptides. Um, you can't fight it. So when you're in the ocean, say, as I grew up swimming in the ocean, I've swallowed a lot of the Pacific. But, um, you know, you're a little kid, you're learning how to swim in the ocean. And, you know, there's those times where you, you, you just, like a wave comes along and just like rolls you up and you literally get rolled up onto the shore and you cannot fight it because it's so much bigger than you it will have its way with you and so grief will have its way with you too and also um, a real sense of fragility and um, Loss of confidence. So, it affects all your bodies. Physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And that's why when Carol Schlesinger gave me that handout, it broke it all down like different things. You could act out, you could have, t you know, you could have meltdowns crying, you might for be forgetful. You might not be able to sleep. You might have, I began having panic attacks literally in the middle of the night where I would wake up having a panic attack. So it can, grief can do all kinds of uh, stuff to you, definitely. And so this was um, some of the best advice I got from uh, Dr. Schlesinger is that you just have to not pressure yourself to do things and that uh, perfection is not an option and perfection is way overrated 
And so taking it one day at a time, and if you can't do that, you might have to take it one hour at a time. And you might have to take it one minute at a time. Or one, one second, second at a time. And sometimes all you can do is breathe. And breathing was one of the best things that, um, that it's a great practice and in grief, if you're feeling bad, I found breathing deeply helped. Um, because it's not like you can turn off the grief and say, gee, this didn't happen and you know things aren't messed up. It's another thing someone called and said. Remember you are loved. Because in the midst of grief, you have to go to work. <laughs> These are some of my work peeps that I work with. <coughs> These are all doctors in Division of Hospital Medicine at UCSF. And then this is um, my colleague, Evans Whitaker, who is a retired, he's, my, he's a librarian, but who works in the office next door to me. But he's a retired family practice doctor, but I meet with these people twice a month and help them with their complicated medical cases, along with wit. And work continues. Just because you're grieving, it doesn't mean that things stop. Nothing stops. Daily living. The reason I put living in quotes is that a lot of things just stopped getting done when I had my grief. And I remember that in my shower there was a tile that had like a little mold growing between the grout. And I remember it just got longer and longer. And it was like two or three months before I could actually get the gumption enough to like that weird little string of mold that was growing. So daily living, it still goes on. You still sort of fumble, have to fumble through it. I wasn't very good at that. And, um, you know, family obligations. I still had to feed my kitties. But what about the mummified heart? I was walking around feeling like the mummification process, but it actually um, does heal. A big part of my healing uh, was Reiki. I took Reiki one and two after Inayat died, and then uh, I've been doing um, Reiki mastery over the last year with uh, a different Reiki master and that when I started the Reiki Mastery Program, <clears throat> during the Reiki circle that we had that day, I just had a vision that like the, the stuff was unwrapping, the mummy wrappings were coming off and flying away from me through the air. So the Reiki was profound for me. And uh, meditation, um, and I'll just say, I don't care what kind, it doesn't matter, whatever you call it. Uh, it, it. That was one of the things that was helpful to me too, was that I had been a meditator for many years and that I still could turn to that practice. But realistically, just, I had to try new things. Um, just to be functioning, I had to force myself to try things that I didn't do with my husband. Because anytime I did anything that we did together, the tsunami would come. <laughs> so I, I had to really strategize. I'm like, well, I have to get out. I have to do something. I can't just sit at home and eat ice cream and drink wine and cry. <laughs> I can't do that. So I started going to theater. 
and I forced myself to get out of my neighborhood. <coughs> this is the corner of, uh, this is North Beach, corner of um, Columbus, Columbus and Kearney, and Kearney with yeah. where that, um, that's a, a copper building. Yeah. yeah, the oh. copper building. Yeah. So I had to force myself, actually, to, you know, get out of my neighborhood, go and do things, um, walk in nature was helpful. It's nice that I live by the park because that would always be pretty soothing. I took hula dancing. That was really worth it. So I would recommend dance or something like it. And then maybe create. So what I did was I took this encaustic workshop with uh, an artist named Judith, Judith Williams who lives in Mill Valley. And um, encaustic is a, a, a type of uh, work where you, you work with um, beeswax and tree sap. And it's a technique of painting and fusing. So you work with heat guns and torches and you create these archival quality paintings on board. And so these, these are my little encaustics that I made at my first workshop. This one's called Coffee. Mm -hmm. This one's called Clouds. <coughs> this one's called Cells. Um, I, I actually did this workshop when I was having radiation treatments for breast cancer, and so I had I was, I, these are all kind of mixed media. With encaustic, you can embed uh, paper and stuff in the wax. So you paint the wax over the paper and then you fuse it and you keep painting. And then the fusing is what, when you're using a heat gun, that's why you've painted different layers of colors. And then when you're using the heat, that's what creates that marble effect. But I, I cut out a, a boob top and then those things look to me like cells. So that was, ac this is actually the first encaustic I made, this, this particular one. And then um, I also made this one called the Burning Breast. And this one was, uh, you know, you can carve in, you can carve in, then you can use this other, like a crayon-y thing, and then you can wipe it off. And then you see in there, there's all the little lines. You, you can carve, uh, I had dental instruments that I was using to carve into the wax because uh, the artist, Judith Williams, is my dental hygienist, but she's a really good artist. Um, so create, that was helpful in my healing process. And um, writing for me. But the bottom line is if you're not a writer, do whatever. Whatever kind of creative act you can um, to help in the healing process, just do it. Say la. So this is Imperial Beach Pier, and the way. Uh, so this is how the beaches were where I grew up. Imperial Beach is the closest beach to the Tijuana border, and then as you go up. Then you get to the Silver Strand State Park, and then as you go up, you get to Coronado Island, which is not an island because it's on an isthmus, but they call it Coronado Island. But those really were like the three beaches that I, I spent most of my time going to. And then the final um, acts of courage. And I, I think really, um, getting to the point where um, you just can find happiness in small things uh, helps the most. So getting out of bed is an act of courage when you're having a hard time with grief. Or maybe um, not wearing your pajamas all day. So these are things I did, like stayed in bed all day. Stayed in my pajamas for an entire weekend. These things happen. So if you do get out of your PJs, 
it's a success. <coughs> Making it through the work week, this is actually where I work. This is called the living room. It is right outside where my offices are on the main floor of the library. We have a little coffee bar there and usually lots of people hanging out in this area. So this is, and then cooking for one, the fact that I would make myself a meal, that was an act of courage. Um, because certainly there was a lot of ice cream consumed. And helping others um, actually helped me because I had a friend whose wife died six months after my husband died and he was left with three kids. I started going over <coughs> and cooking dinner for his kids on the weekends and it actually was a very healing thing for me um, at that period. Also, um, accepting help and being grateful that people will help me. That was good to learn how to accept help. Also, understanding your limitations. Because sometimes you just aren't going to have the energy to do something you want to do. And uh, so don't beat yourself up over that. So one of the other good things that came out of it was uh, saying no, okay to say no, okay to hide, that's okay. <laughs> but also another good thing that came out was oh, it's okay to say yes too. And um, even now sometimes, you know, someone will ask me to do something and I'll, I'll like sort of have an automatic, oh, and then I'm like, wait a minute. I should do it because somebody's even asking me to do something, you know, so uh, it, it's those decisions can be hard, saying yes and no, but they become even more important when you're going through a grieving period and you don't have the level of energy you would otherwise. And um, noticing beauty helped me and just nature is everywhere even if you're in the city. You know, you'll see a bird, or I would see like all the parrots one day came, the parrots of Coal Valley all came and were in my tree in my backyard. <laughs> I counted 16 of them before they all flew away, but there were more than that. The little green ones with the orange <laughs> hats. So noticing beauty, um, and also I found myself, it would soothe me if I went out to Ocean Beach and just sat and listened to the waves. And then mood shifting. So mood shifting, um, this is say you're, you're walking along and you notice, like I would notice that I would be having negative feelings, like I would actually be having like bad negative thoughts about myself or about anything. But I would be beating myself up usually like, you're so stupid, you know, it'd be like bad self-talk. and. You know, I'd, I'd beat myself up mentally like because I, I didn't get this done or I didn't have a clean house or anything. And um, so I began trying to think up, come up with ways to shift out of that mood um, if I was in it. And um, the things that helped me the most were uh, walking meditation, um, dancing, or any kind of exercise actually. <coughs> and rhythmic breathing. Those were the things that helped me when I noticed I had that in my mood and it seemed like stuck, like a tape loop that I wasn't getting over. I began trying to practice getting over it. And I just love these embroidered grains, mm -hmm. you know? Cool. I think they're you so, it, yeah, it was, I found it on, on Flickr, Creative Commons, but, and then, enjoy the quiet, because uh, unless you go within, it's not gonna settle down. You have to actually do it. It settles down with time, but a lot of it is just inner work. And this picture I like particularly because it reminded me of Gwen Miller, a woman of few words and great wisdom. 
And I remember she had four C's and the last one was no unnecessary conversation. And when I saw this picture, I had to figure out a way to put it in. So that's how that got in there. And then this one, of course, you have to have a sense of humor. And this one reminded me of Joe Miller. Because Joe used to always say, without a sense of humor, there is no limit to the abyss of idiocy that one can fall into. Selah. <laughs> yeah. And this is um, La Jolla Cove, which is in the northern part of San Diego. Very beautiful, and where uh, Dr. Seuss lived. Final poems. So I had a few, I brought a few of my own poems. <laughs> I'm just going to read a couple. Um, this is uh, called a high bun, this poem. The form is called a high bun, which is a, a <clears throat> prose poem that ends in a haiku. And um, this is called Dia de los Muertos. Many relatives gone, I bring their pictures out, arranging pieces of past. For fall, all weeds cut down, harvest of memories, special bread, candles, chocolates. A tall vase full of mums, final roses picked from garden, sweet. My old lives, you are faded, washed and wrung out. Prayer flags flapping in sun, beads strung on green thread, held in hand, the weight of smoothly polished wood. Skeleton hangs on front porch, formal goodbyes to my old thoughts and what I forgot to friends who sang with me, who sing still when sunset drips gold across purple ocean, head follows heart, galaxies swirl and swell, pour out their stars. Black and white photos, grandmother, grandfather, others, moonrise through cloud and mist. Tilopa Revisited. God is not a knot. Imagine nothing if you dare. Analysis is limited. Forget the meditative state. Reflection is an empty mirror. It's natural to be. Don't abandon. Don't adopt. And since it's the season, um, this is actually a sonnet, Easter Sunday Lemon Curd, I bring the bag of Meyer lemons home. Nearing Easter, nearing revelations, I decided on angel <coughs> food. The stones in the yard gleamed, a quiet summation of ingredients, check cupboards and fridge. A robin sings on the back fence. I leave to buy eggs and pastry flour. The bridge across the river is raised. Small boats weave through the channel toward the turning basin. I break eggs using the three bowl method. After the whipping and folding, no sins emerge. The yolks, the grated zest, the melted butter. I stir as the finch sings and brings to the maple its twigs and fluff and string. Horses that rescue me in dreams. Does the cone become a forest behind me? Does the square of blue cloth become a river if dropped at the perfect moment? I run and run, heart like hoofbeats. What chases me unseen feels familiar. Luckily, I have a spoon. Wood is a good omen as I tear through spidery brush. Woe is wasted on the sad. It never reaches forever, never catches up to understanding. Will my spoon become a boat? 
No, this time the horse is in Appaloosa, standing serene, as if she had nothing better to do. I ride without saddle or bridle. The shadows roll and roll away. And then I want to read another poem by Stan. This was Stan Rice, who was my mentor and uh, thesis advisor. <laughs> um, I'm just going to read the last one in his book. He wrote this and um, they're all uh, written as if he's taking after the Psalms in the Bible, he's continuing. And they're numbered consecutively after, you know, where they would start, 151. So this is Psalm 212. Why think these songs irrational? They are no more so than the hive. In Mercury, I seek the method of the molten. I remember mercy in my praise of the chain. The green apple is red where slapped. Why should my psalm sicken or be blasted like blackbirds by shotguns from trees? Why would you bypass being adored by the radio? For each gift pump the moment. The herring are numerous and the Lord's sperm are words, as am I. I was lost and sang my broken down songs in the hell of the hour. Then in my heart moved an oar, and I was found by a breeze from a door in the sea of forms, and was rowed to the cherry trees on the shore. Selah, Selah. 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 And uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure what beach this is, but it is in San Diego. It might be Mission Beach, but I can't remember which beach I searched for. <laughs> Questions? Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.